So glad you could join us. My name's Tim, and I'm here with my cohort, Pat. We're here at a wonderful place, the Museum of American Speed in Lincoln, Nebraska. We're celebrating Racer Appreciation Week this week, and it's one of our favorite times of the year. It's a time when we can communicate, give back, talk to our customers and our racers, and we thought today would be a lot of fun to walk through just the perfect backdrop to talk about the history of safety equipment in racing. We, we have examples in this museum that tell the story going all the way back to 1909. And I think that the story we're trying to tell is that safety equipment is so, so valuable, so important. Unfortunately, it's what a lot of people overlook when they're building a race car. You know, everybody wants to go fast, everybody wants the car to perform, but a lot of times they stick all their money in that side of it and they forget about safety equipment. You know, one thing about a lot of the examples you'll see in the museum, a lot of these guys didn't make it. Uh, they actually passed away racing, and, and that's very sad. But you know, it gives us a chance to look at some of the equipment through the years, talk a little bit about the cars and, and the people that drove them, and I hope you have a lot of fun. We're gonna walk around. This is a huge museum. It's actually three stories, 150,000 square feet. We have over 200 vehicles on display, many more in storage. We have over 1,000 engines. We're just going to scratch the surface today, but I'm glad you'll be able to come along and get a little taste of, of what it's like. Pat, anything you wanted to add before we start walking around? No, let's dig in, man. Let's check this out. All right, great. Well, come along, guys. This will be fun. The first car we're going to talk about is one of my all-time favorites, and this car really tells the story of the early days in racing. If you look at this thing, this is actually a Miller Ford built in 1936, 1935 actually, raced in 36 and a few years after that. But basically what you see here is a car built for speed. It had a driver and a ride-along mechanic. And as you can see, no seat belts, no roll bar. You know, these guys were these guys were kind of wild men. This would be would have been like the X Games, you know, of now <laughs> nowadays. You know, right. People that really love living on the edge. You think about the driver, you know, he's in control of the car. The ride-along mechanic, he was there to pump oil and fuel. A lot of times the, the ride-along mechanic would have just massaged the driver's hands if the driver would have, you know, had a cramp in his hand during the race. That was all part of his job. But think about the guy riding in the car, you know, basically handing his life to a driver. And a lot of these guys uh, didn't make it, you know. I think there were over 13 ride-along mechanics in the short time ride-along mechanics were allowed or, or required at Indy that passed away. They didn't end up making it. Usually when the driver passed away, the ride-along mechanic did too, unfortunately. But this is a really great car. If you ever get a chance to come to the museum and, and view this thing, it's, it's a work of art. Front-wheel drive, V8 flathead. Uh, this was designed by Miller and uh, Preston Tucker, and they worked with Vetzel Ford on the design. Unfortunately, while they qualified really well, they didn't do so well in the race. The steering boxes overheated, and it created a lot of problems uh, for the car. Uh, Henry Ford was a little bit embarrassed, and he actually stuck these cars away until later and, and picked a few good friends that he'd sell them to. So we're so proud to have one in our collection. It's pretty cool. So, yeah, we'll walk all over this way, and we'll kind of fast forward in time a little bit. number 45 car and this car is barn fresh just like it was raced this car would have come out and, and been competitive when they finally got around to no longer requiring a ride along uh, ride along mechanic rather the cool thing about this car is it was much smaller than a lot of the indie racers of the day and one of the things they did uh, Joey Chitwood is the guy that drove this car and he was the first to install seat belts and the seat belts weren't to keep them in the car you know Oddly enough, a lot of these guys thought, you know, just like a motorcycle or a bicycle racer of today, bailing out was the best way to survive. Of course, you know, this was the first car to have seat belts, but the only reason it had seat belts to start with is because the track was so bumpy, it was hard for the driver to keep his foot on the gas. So the seat belt was only to keep his foot on the, on the go pedal to, to keep going in the race, but very interesting indeed. The car right behind it's very similar. It, it's, you know, very rudimentary if you look at the cockpit. Obviously, these guys weren't thinking about creature comforts. And uh, while this car does have seat belts as well, you know, it wasn't something that you could buy from any kind of supply store of the day. Not like nowadays at Speedway Motors where you can order up a five-way safety right, harness. Right, right. I wonder what that seat belt, you know, was initially meant for. You know, was this the harness for something or be very... Uh, I wish you guys could actually smell these cars. I mean, you get up close to some of these cockpits and they smell like your grandpa's barn. They're, right. You know, they're, they're uh, obviously uh, untampered with 
examples from, from days gone by. And Bree, if you could take a, a shot of up top there, you can kind of see a car going over. Um, you know, definitely a scary thing to see the cars. You're right, Pat. Pretty interesting. And I've been studying up on early Indy 500 racing and you know, some of the, the racing uh, crashes that were actually captured. You know, the footage exists out there if you go on uh, Google and you look at some of these crashes. It's it's amazing to see how these guys would fly out of the cars, get run over by the cars, and you know, uh, unfortunately, racing was very, very dangerous, and, and it is still today. Wouldn't oh, yeah. you agree? Yeah. I think you know, despite what the T-shirts say, I think racing is still something you have to take very seriously. You betcha. So we're gonna walk over this way. We've got a pretty cool display of some early helmets. We'll talk about helmets a little bit. You bet. I love this case because it kind of shows a wide uh, variety of helmets going all the way back to the pre-war era where helmets were basically like a hard hat or a piece of styrofoam on your head. And you know, you, I couldn't imagine strapping myself into a race car with some of these helmets. And so again, some of these still have the dirt on them from the race tracks they were raced at. Yeah, this one here that uh, Bree is showing, this one actually has cracks in it. So you, you wonder, you know, did a rock hit the guy in the head? Was that from an accident? Um, you just don't know. So that was from like uh, early 1950 stock cars, what that one says. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, well, some of my favorite hel helmets in this case are the Jan Opperman helmets. You know, I, I, he's obviously one of our heroes here at Speedway Motors as far as a driver. We have, we've uh, worked with a lot of drivers over the years, and, and uh, there's just something special about certain drivers and how they did things. But when you look at these two examples, a really early Opperman helmet with the goggles and then the, the later 1976 helmet, you know, you see he's been doing the same thing over those uh, uh, years. He uses the duct tape to kind of make that little slit. Of course, that was for daytime racing where you get a lot of glare. And he tried to cut down on that. You know, the human eye is a very amazing thing. You know, how it can look through that little slit and still uh, be able to function and see everything going on on the track. You bet. And kind of as we make our way to the left, you can kind of see some of the newer helmets as they evolved. Um, obviously, with newer helmets, you have better cushioning better safety, you know, uh, how the helmet uh, reacts on impact. Um, this one here, this, uh, this colorful bell helmet has kind of a side air, which might have been a, an early version of the side air setup. Down here is kind of a, I think that says mud eater. Would have been for tear off machine. Right, right. And of course, as you can see, other racers use the whole duct tape deal to kind of help cut down on glare during the day. And uh, since we're talking about helmets, you know, we talk about snow rating and what's necessary in, in, uh, at, at your tracks. Um, so like just recently, this last year, we had Snell 2015 come out. And uh, so that's the newest helmet, the best uh, safety rating uh, for helmets. And you know, uh, you can kind of get away with like a Snell 10 um, at some of your tracks, but you want to check out and see what's, what's necessary in your sanctioning bodies. Because uh, you know, a lot of our customers are IMCA uh, racers. And so pretty much you can get away with uh, the new Snell 2015 helmet, the Snell 2010. But if you have a Snell 2005, uh, you might not be in luck and you want to give us a call and, and check out and see what we have for new helmets. Yeah, it's a great time to buy a helmet right now because with the new Snell ratings that came out, chances are that helmet's going to last a long time yep. and you'll be able to use it, get a lot of use out of it. So what do you say we keep looking around? Yeah, let's check All it right. out. Let's go. got this first room pretty full of some of our favorite dirt track cars over the over the years. And it's a really great story that, that is told with so many of these cars, is the evolution of car builders and safety equipment like we've been talking about. And this is a really good place to stop and just kind of look over the room in its entirety because you know as you look to the right side, you see the early cars that obviously there were no roll bars, you know, hardly seat belts, you know nothing by way of creature comforts. And as they kind of evolved, people started putting, you know, roll bars, uh, as you can see, just like a single roll bar over what would be the driver's head. And the misconception is, is that was to protect the driver. Uh, truth of the matter is, guys were really concerned about protecting the fuel cell on these cars. The fuel cells were very expensive. So uh, 
uh, you know, they wanted to keep those intact if they could. Some of these cars, even like the number one car that we're looking at now, has a front hoop on it to try to protect uh, you know, the, the front of the car in a rollover condition. So, uh, but then as we get further down the line, you, know, you see you know, the full roll cages coming into effect. And you know, roll cage, you know, we looked at EMI earlier in the week, and you know, they do such an amazing job you know, with their welding and every, everything is looked at with such precision and detail because every single one of those welds needs to hold uh, and when you get into a crash situation. Well, Tim, was there, a, was there a saying about these three cars? As you can see the safety, the, the lack of roll bar on the first one and then we get more into roll bars. Was there, was there a saying? Um, yeah, we have, a, we have a racing historian here that common re re commonly refers to the open cars as being a closed casket and then the roll bar being an open casket, and then when you get into the full, you know, roll cage, you know, that's your couple weeks in the hospital. And, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's again, a testament to how dangerous racing can be. But if you think carefully about safety equipment, you can just hold quite a bit. You bet. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, check out just down here in the, uh, the Indy Road Tim. Yeah, this is our Indy kit. This is one of our favorite uh, parts of the museum. Obviously, some early examples of not only Indy racers, uh, but also in the engines going all the way up to the modern time. Also, uh, kind of a uh, reenactment of what the Indy garage would have looked like kind of in the 1950s era, which is pretty cool. This was one of Bill's favorite spots in the museum. Spent a lot of time in here. Well, there's a good story about this car, you know, speaking about roll cages. This is the Kenny Greitz car, and Kenny was a, a great racer. He uh, actually won the Knoxville Nationals in 1969 in this car. And it was set up just like this with the full roll cage on it. Of course, this one could be unbolted because back in those days, if you had a roll cage at certain sanctioning uh, tracks, uh, that was considered a super modified. So he won the 1969 Knoxville Nationals over some pretty stiff competition, some pretty good drivers. And then, you know, just a little while after that, a few weeks uh, had gone by, he came to race the state fair here in Lincoln, Nebraska. And in that time, you weren't considered a sprint car if you had a roll cage. So he took the roll cage off the car. Unfortunately, he was killed in that race because uh, you know, without with the lack of the roll bar, when the car got upside down, it caused some, some trouble. So we love this car. It's on loan from the Knoxville Museum, uh, soon to go back. Uh, but uh, really good story. Kenny was 25 years old at the time. Uh, a lot of promise as a driver, too. And this is a good place to talk a little bit about fuel cells. I want to touch on those a little bit. Here's our hero, Jan Opperman, and his car. Uh, this was a, a very famous Jan Opperman car. But the thing I want to point your attention to is the fuel cell on this particular sprint car because it was simply aluminum. Uh, back in those days, you didn't run an inner bladder in your, in your race car. And you know, that could be a problem. Fire was obviously uh, something that a lot of race car drivers worry about throughout the ages. You know, if you puncture your fuel tank, uh, you can imagine you're going to want to get out of that car awful fast with all the hot exhaust and sparks flying around. Yeah. So, uh, you know, an aluminum fuel tank was definitely a step up from the one I'm going to show you here in a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it just helps to look at now a modern fuel cell in a sprint car, which is uh, designed very similar to what a dirt modified would look like with an inner bladder in it. This is actually a, uh, you know, a fiberglass or a uh, carbon fiber tank with an inner bladder in it. So if it uh, gets hit, it's very hard to puncture. Of course, uh, a modified uh, fuel tank or a stock car fuel tank, we'll look at that a little further down the line where it's an actual steel enclosure, so it's really hard to crush or puncture, uh, but then it also has a plastic inner liner too. And that's pretty cool because you can see like all the baffling in there, some of the cars going around corners and stuff. Uh, yeah, you're always having fuel pickup all the time. This car's a great cutaway. <laughs> this thing doesn't have a part on it that's not cut up, so you can see how the inner workings operate, which is really cool. So we go from the ultra-modern to something that's very archaic uh, back in the early days, and it's a big piece of our Speedway Motors history, and that's this 4X32 Ford. And if you want to take a look at this fuel tank, holy cow, this thing's crazy. It's actually an oxygen tank out of a T47 uh, super Fortress. So, you know, back in those days, guys would just find whatever they could to make into fuel tanks. You see a lot of old early hot rods running around with those oxygen tank uh, cool. fuel cells, too. But just a neat car. Tells a little bit of the story of, of our company, too, going back all the way before 1952. Of course, we were founded in 1952 by yep. Bill and Joyce. And, and uh, you know, just that rich history we try to preserve in all three of these cars that were very meaningful to the growth of our company, which is 
pretty cool. And then so, over here to the right, Brie, oh, yeah. uh, sorry, Tim. No, good point. This is the, the safety barrier that was engineered here at the University of Nebraska, so here in our hometown. And, you know, that barrier is used in uh, even today's NASCAR uh, and IndyCar races. So uh, definitely a, a step up in safety for, for crash barriers. Energy absorption is key. Yes. Boy, you think about the old days of concrete barriers or, you know, the old I-beam, you know, steel enclosures. And obviously you want to take as much of that energy off the driver as you can. And, and this is a great example. We're very proud of this. Is engineered here in Lincoln. Pretty yeah, because cool. as we all know, it's not speed that's going to kill you, it's that instant stop. Yeah, so. that's right. We'll talk about that a little bit in a minute, too, with some of the other safety equipment. So that's a good point. Well, this is always a fun part to, to walk through this hallway. Yeah, we've got one of our as found stock cars here in this display. We're always proud of that. And then, of course, our engine room. And, uh, this is a, a collection of engines. We call them, Bill always called them, the ladies in waiting. They're the engines that are either waiting for parts or waiting for restoration, or uh, we're just using them to, to research other things. And they're mostly racing car engines, but there's a few aircraft engines in here too, as long as, as well as uh, different headlights, grill shells, different speed equipment over the ages. So yeah. just a small a small glimpse into part of the collection here. Bray, Bray, you gotta you gotta come over here real quick <laughs> on this. I can't help it. It cracks me up every time. Back on there, there's a squirrel back there on the trunk lid. I don't know. For the kids, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we enjoy that kind of stuff here at the museum. And again, you know, with, with three floors and 150,000 square feet, that's just one of the displays that we, we try to kind of keep rustic and kind of as found. We're very proud here at the museum of our docent volunteer staff. We have over 50 volunteers that help us out at the museum. We just finished up with a docent training program. So anytime we get new archives uh, or new objects in the museum, uh, we, we train the docent staff on what they are, where they came from. So as they're giving tours to people that visit the museum, uh, they can speak intelligently about that. And, and we're so thankful to have their help. They, they really make this a rich, rich environment. Off to our right is, Tim, this is where they uh, restore the, the engines as they come in? Absolutely. How fun is this? Not only do they play 80s music in here a lot when they're working on engines, which is right up my alley, they uh, they also have all kinds of new things. Thank you. Coming. So, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful place. And we get engines from all over the place. Sometimes places like the Henry Ford Museum, you know, we get experimental Ford engines. You just never know what's coming. We're working on a Mickey Thompson Indy engine right now from the 60s. That's a uh, dual overhead cam motor. It's very, very interesting. We're kind of entering the new addition now of the museum on the first floor. And of course, this is one of my favorite cars of all time. I'm a, I'm a vintage hot robber, so this thing speaks my language. This is the Art Gear dry weights car. But what I love so much about this car, not only that it's used it uses all old school parts. That tells the story of how these cars were built. This car was built in 1951, and you see the open floor, you, know, you can see the ground going by as you're cruising this thing along at, at 100 miles an hour, but you know, a very rudimentary seat, no padding, just something they found out of an old aircraft, and that was good enough. Of course, we'll see the ultimate in seats here in just a minute uh, when we look at some of our NASCAR stuff, but uh, this car kind of tells that story a little bit about yeah, again, the early days in racing and how safety wasn't really thought of that much. Of course, we kind of get around on dry lakes uh, cars and we get into an area that we kind of devoted just for safety. Uh, this talks about some of the, the advancements here recently in, in racing technology and, and uh, you know, some of the improvements that have been made to fire suits. Fire suit you see in the corner, Valvoline suit, that's a really cool piece. That was actually the suit Bill Simpson uh, caught himself on fire. I shouldn't say caught himself. He actually lit himself on fire at, at the Indianapolis Speedway. And he was trying to show you know, how safe his, his safety equipment was. Of course, he was decked out in that suit and helmet and, and uh, neck restraint and, and whatnot. And, and as you see, the suit you know, survived very well. They, they actually sprayed them with gasoline before they did it. That was in 1989, and uh, we've had a really good working relationship with, 
with Simpson. They're, they're obviously one of the products we sell and we're so proud to carry you know, in our catalog of Speedway Motors. And then three uh, over here, as you saw when we first entered in, was the, the cold fire suppression system. We have a couple different brands here at Speedway now uh, for cold fire suppression. And I think even this year there might, be, might have been some talk about um, suppression systems being needed in, in, in some of the classes. Uh, so, you know, check out your rules, check out your sanctioning body. And uh, if you have any questions about cold fire suppression systems, you can always give us a call here at Speedway. We have awesome techs on hand, and most of those guys are racers themselves, so they'd be more than happy to help you out with that. Oh, that's great, Pat. I'm glad you mentioned that. I forgot about fire suppression. It's very important. As this picture shows, holy yes. cow, we, we took this picture out of our archives, and holy macro, you, know, you see uh, a situation no driver wants to be a part of. Of course, that was back in the early days, and you know, when fire obviously was, was as big a problem. Yeah. So you can always deal with that. Uh, one of the cool artifacts we have here Museum is one of the first. Well, this is actually the first Hans device. Uh, this was given to us by the doctor and the team that helped develop the Hans device. They actually lovingly refer to this Hans as the Franken Hans because it was so huge compared to what the Hans device uh, would end up becoming uh, as it was uh, refined uh, in the coming years. Uh, of course, uh, head and neck restraints are so very important. If you get on YouTube or Google uh, and, and search for Hans footage, there's actually a really great video out there that shows uh, some test situations uh, with and without a Hans device, and it shows, you know, when you, when you come to that sudden stop, you know, how your head really tries to almost detach from your body. It's, it's, right. it's really fascinating to me, but the Hans is such a huge help with that. A lot of guys say, you know what, I don't want to deal with the cost, I don't want to deal with the discomfort of a Hans device, but it really can make, make such a difference in, in that situation nobody ever thinks is going to happen to them, but, you know, so I would highly recommend it. And Pat, we, we don't only carry the Hans, we have a few other Yeah, devices. we have a couple other brands of head and neck restraints, and then, as you can see, this one, this one's more of the modern style Hans, uh, but here at Speedway, we offer uh, the fully adjustable ones, so ones that you can adjust the angle, so it doesn't really matter what kind of racing vehicle, um, you know, you're putting this in or using it against, uh, we have those here at Speedway. And, you know, it's not just guys with sprint cars, late models, you know, they use this uh, this kind of technology in NASCAR, and even, uh, you know, children racing go-karts, 10-year-olds, uh, I've seen with, with the Hans device on. So you can run those, you can even run this. This is kind of the old school uh, foam neck brace, um, but obviously not as safe as running a full neck restraint. So you can get those for children, and then uh, on up to, you know, your NASCAR racer. So uh, we have all that here at Speedway. And I couldn't leave this corner without looking at the fuel cells. So and uh, you know, we talked a little bit about you know what you'd run in a stock car or modified, and this is very similar to what that design would be. Obviously, it's like it's going to go into battle, and it's, there's a good reason for it. And we carry these. We carry all your tip-over valves and everything you would need to design a safe fuel system. So keep us in mind. Give us a call if you have questions. You know, we'll talk about that a little bit later too. But we have a wonderful tech staff on board here at Speedway. We're always happy to, to help you work through whatever issues you have with your setup. Of course, we're moving into another favorite area of mine. This is the land speed record area. Of course, we have a great uh, car to my right here. This is the McKeegan Schultz Streamliner. And this has kind of a cool story that relates to safety. Uh, this car uh, set the record at, at uh, the Salt Flats for the fastest small block Chevy. Uh, and uh, it wasn't always easy. You know, these guys went there a number of years. Uh, obviously, uh, the top speed this car ever drove was 346 miles an hour. Uh, you can imagine at those speeds, any any issues become big issues. Uh, of course, now uh, you know this car looks beautiful, but this car actually rolled once. Uh, it actually uh, rolled over a hose clamp out on the field and cut a perfect circle out of one of the rear tires, and it caused the car to go out of control and, and it, it barrel rolled. And what saved the driver's life, I'd like to think, not only the good engineering as a good roll cage, uh, but being strapped so tightly in the car. And I've talked to John. Uh, who was one of the engineers who designed the car at, at length about you know how important it was to keep the driver tethered down and you know that you know that is very true for all types of racing you don't want any of your appendages to to fly out of the car I mean you want to keep everything intact 
uh, Tim Scherf, the guy who drove this car, you know, actually had his arm strapped down. So, you know, he was only able to steer and shift gears. He wasn't able to actually ignite the engine, you know, and do some of those activities because, you know, it was very important to have him strapped down. Thank goodness he was. You know, he would go on to, to do many other things with, with hot rods and race cars. So, uh, so that's kind of a neat story. And that thing has all the belt ballistics too. Uh, you can see down here, just uh, right of the driver, there's fire suppression tank there. Um, oh, sure. Yep, there's one for the engine and one for the driver compartment. So no matter where a fire would break out, you know, he's got it covered. So uh, again, in this type of racing, every car is different, you know. So uh, he's having to design a lot of these components and the systems and how they work. but. They all work on the same principle as, as what we deal with today. Well, here's another uh, piece of, you know, kind of fire suit history. Tim, can you tell us a little bit about this one? Yeah, this is really cool. This is a donation we recently received from Sonny Rossi and his wife. Sonny's a really cool guy. Uh, as you might be able to tell from the pictures, he's a little person. Uh, but he's a gear daddy. He, uh, he's been involved in racing all kinds of things over the years, not to mention he's a true gentleman and a nice guy. Uh, but this suit in this, in this glass case was actually the second suit that was ever made by Bill Simpson because as you can imagine, Sonny couldn't just go down to the local store and buy himself a good fire suit. You know, he, he's still alive today. Uh, you know, he's retired from racing, but he, he had a successful career and, and lived to tell about it because he, he always thought about safety. And we're so thankful to have Bill Simpson's second suit here at the museum. It's really That's nice really piece. Cool. Well, over to our right at some uh, earlier drag cars. Tony Nancy Streamliner, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. even says the loner on the car for a reason. I guess you know, some days I feel like that. <laughs> you know, it's like, just leave me alone. I'm going to go racing. But, uh, you know, again, uh, very innovative car. Just one of the many pieces here at the museum that you can come and check out that you're not going to see anywhere else in the world. And, and that's why I feel so fortunate to be here, you know, with, with so many great examples. Of course, uh, behind, uh, behind you is a, a motorcycle that is built with a small block Chevy V8. How many times have you seen one of those? This guy had to had to be some kind of crazy to drive this thing down the quarter mile V8 powered uh, motorcycle. I mean, it's Jim and Chris. It's got the old wizard fuel tank on there. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, you want to check out this one on the end here, Tim? Yeah, this is a pretty neat car. This is actually the Fargo Dragster, and this set the record for the fastest four-cylinder going down the quarter mile. It was built in 1961, and with all these front-engine dragsters, you know, obviously one of the major concerns was having the rear end explode because you're basically sitting on the pumpkin of the rear end. This car was early enough. This was a 1961 car, and uh, that quick change, as you can see, was right in a dangerous spot for the driver, and it, it's got a pretty interesting piece of safety equipment on there, which was basically a giant steel plate or a blast shield to, right. to protect uh, to protect you in case the worst happened, which is pretty interesting. We've yeah, had I, to show that off. I, I think the tag on that uh, kind of said it all. So. <laughs> so yeah, as you can see off to your right, uh, as you're seeing on the screen there, there's some more modern technology. Uh, yeah. You know, that probably has all the best safety equipment on there that you can find. Cars that were meant to blow apart in an accident. You know, that was a 24 hours at Le Mans car. Herb Fischel was actually just here at the museum visiting us. Herb was uh, in command of General Motors uh, racing program for over 30 years. And talk about an interesting guy to, to communicate with and sit down and talk to. He could tell you chapter and verse about this caddy and all the NASCAR days working with Dale Earnhardt and Smokey Eunuch. And boy, that was a real... Real treat meeting. We get visitors like that here at the museum often, and that's what makes this job so much fun, obviously. Of course, we have some early NASCAR stuff. Uh, to the left, we have the David Pearson car, won, uh, won the Daytona 500 in 1976. Uh, 
scandal was that Jeep's uh, Richard Petty out there actually on the last lap and they crashed into each other. Petty couldn't get his car fired up again, but Pearson did, limped it across the line for, for a pretty memorable finish. Pretty neat car. Back in the Jeep cars are fast boat metal plate. I mean, I love that car. Yeah, I love that. We'll just touch on this Ford Fusion NASCAR, the number nine car, a little bit. And I just call attention to the seat in this car. This has a full containment Butler built seat. And you know we carry a lot of uh, full containment seats here at Speedway. So you can have the same technology as uh, you know, your famous NASCAR drivers of the time. I mean, were, and the reason for that is you, know, you want to keep yourself from flailing around in the car if for some reason you, you get out of shape. So a really neat piece. gives us a little bit of a taste of, yeah. I guess we're scratching the surface really, aren't it we? It is. The there's, there's way too much to show uh, in just a small portion of time. It's definitely, you know, if you're anywhere in the Midwest near Lincoln, Nebraska, you have to stop here and check out this museum. And, I mean, it's just amazing. Like Tim said, there's three stories to this, and I think we only saw about half of the first floor. And as you can see behind us, there's uh, street cars, uh, some early stuff, uh, even some custom stuff. I mean, they, we have a little bit of everything here at the museum for you to see. You're right, Pat. And, and we're really scratching the surface. You know, like the museum on Facebook. Come visit us. You know, we do daily posts to kind of show what's happening at the museum, new acquisitions. We're getting new cars all the time. A lot of donations. You know, if you know of any historic racing engines or parts, we're always trying to source new objects for the museum. We're always happy to talk to you about that. Really, the main message today here is racer appreciation. We appreciate you. Had you visited us in years past, you know we'd open the doors uh, for all of our racers uh, so you could come into the museum and walk around. I hope you'll take us up on the offer to come visit us again. Uh, you know, see the website for our hours. It, uh, lists it there because it's always changing depending upon whether it's summer or winter hours. Uh, but uh, it's important to know that. Also, you know, ask us any questions that you have. We're here to help you. It's important when you go racing this year that you have the best equipment. Now, who knows? Your car may end up in a museum such as this. You know, then that's the dream, right? That's why we all go racing and, and, and uh, engage in this endeavor anyway, because you know it's it's about bragging rights and doing something uh, other people don't commonly. So we're excited that you were able to join us. We hope you'll come visit us soon. Ask us any questions. Pat, yes. what am I forgetting? You know, give us a call. Uh, like I said, we always have texts on the phone pretty much all day long, it seems like. So uh, if you have race questions, uh, questions on street cars, basically any of the safety equipment you saw here today, um, we can hook you up. And we do have uh, knowledgeable texts on the phones that would be happy to help you out. Um, but, you know, I believe that's about all I have. Yeah, yep, absolutely. So glad you could join us. Just remember, it all starts with a dream. Everything you've seen here was started by Speedy Bill Smith and Joyce over, uh, you know, since 1952, you know, collecting parts and, and kicking up rocks to try to figure out, you know, what they could find and, and keep for the next generation. And, and they were very competitive racers, too. And, and we're all kind of engaged in the same hobby. So we're always glad to spend time together. Hope we'll see you again soon. And thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thank you.